Hello, everybody. Ahoy! Ahoy. Oh, hi. <laughs> hi. <laughs> Hello there, Benjamin. How Long you doing? Long time in chat. Good. Good. So today we're going to talk about our RPG, the Land of Veem. Um, and we'll go through some of the basics first. And then we're also going to get to uh, designing some NPCs, as well as maybe even drawing some if we have the time, and I think we will. But first, we'll we'll start talking about the uh, the actual game, which we've been working on for you know a long time. Long. Yeah, long time, many months. Um, it's a D twelve system. So these are the basic mechanics. Um, you roll a d12 and then for whatever you... you there for one yeah, second. Yeah. So the Land of Eam RPG, for those of you who don't know, is the RPG that takes place in the Rickety Stitch graphic novel series world. And um, many of you may be familiar with the with Rickety Stitch, the story of a skeleton bard who goes on a fantastical adventure to find out who he was when he was alive in the Land of Eam. And so Ben and I want to, you know, create with Wolf huge fans of RPGs. We've been playing Dungeons and Dragons and tons of homebrew stuff since we were kids um, with a lot of our buddies. And we wanted to make our own and have it, you know, give a little tone to it. And Ben will talk more about the tone of, of the land of being. But um, the tone of the Rickety Stitch world, that, uh, that kind of special sauce that goes into the Rickety Stitch stuff. And also is a, is a pretty hilarious window into how we play RPGs. So um, take it away, Ben. Yeah, I mean, the tone is sort of uh, Lord of the Rings meets the Muppets. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's, oh, that's so accurate. It's less of an emphasis on combat, as you might find in something like Dungeons & Dragons, and it's more focused on uh, tools that allow you to be creative and overcome problems without fighting, although you can fight because... Fighting in RPGs is always fun. Um, so there, there are abilities the characters have centered around fighting, especially the knight errant character who we'll get to the class. Um, so that's a basic tone. Like you can, if you encounter like a manticore or something, your first instinct shouldn't be to slay it. Like it'll, it'll have right. a motivation of its own, and it probably won't want to kill you. Um, and here are the dice mechanics, or the main dice mechanic. And it's all based on, you know, uh, it's partial successes and partial failures. So if you roll a one or a two, it's a complete failure. You don't achieve your action and something else bad happens. Um, so let's say you're uh, trying to pick a locked door. Um, you fail to pick the locked door and some guards catch you in the act. That type of thing. The whole point of the system, the die system, is to like push push the story forward no matter what happens. Yeah, and one of the things that's really fun about role-playing and playing adventures is that sometimes things don't go the way you expect. And so Ben and I wanted to create uh, a system that essentially created all those wacky moments that, you know, we laugh about with our friends after we play and talk about, you know, three years after sometimes. Um, by yeah. just having a mechanic that makes things go, but not go, or maybe they don't go, but there's something good about it. And yeah. It's, it's to avoid the situation where you're like, all right, I failed the action. What do we do now? You always want to have something to play off of in the story. Um, so you got your character creation steps, and the first thing you do is pick a class. We'll go take a look at the classes. And just so you guys know, the all the temporary art that's in the the beta rule book is all like lore and sketches and concept designs from our work. Yeah, on it's just stitch theory. leftover drawings that. I had done that we're just repurposing for this. Um, but a lot of them are fun. I mean, I, I kind of want you to scroll back up to the uh, the giant spider with a clipboard. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do that later. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, so 
let's take a look at the bard. Rickety Stitch is a bard. And for example, the level one ability, it's called Narrator. And what you're able to do once per session is narrate a desired outcome of an action. Um, and you start with, and then this, it's basically like, and then uh, Morty bounded like a deer. In a moment he was there, and now he's over here. Um, you'd, you'd say that if, if, you'd, if your party had come face to face with a chasm, and you can just like story tell things into happening as opposed to, all right, we all got to jump. Yeah. It's like everybody rolled dexterity or strength to hold on to the cliff edge. Uh, it's more about making the adventurous thing happen and giving you a power that uh, facilitates that. Right. <clears throat> um, also bards, Bards are kind of like the healers of the party in the system. They heal courage. That's what hit points essentially are. We call it courage. It's more about your uh, will and bravery to remain standing in, in the fight or the journey. And, um, and we got the loyal chum. And this class is based on the gelatinous goo. Uh, the loyal chum is like the glue of the party. They boost allies. Or the and... glue of the party. Uh, oh. Uh, am I right? Am I right? That's really good. <laughs> <laughs> um, so they got a lot of abilities like once per session, if an ally fails a roll, you can attempt to make a check instead and replace the ally's result. Just kind of helping out people. Um, they know old chums. They can make up an old friend that they've run into for help or advice because they're just friends with everybody. And you'll um, see a lot of stuff that's like that. You make up something and it becomes real part of the story, part of the RPG. And uh, we love that. We love that idea. Yeah. Concept. Yes, because it means the players actually have some say in what's going on instead of uh, always having to ask the GM and it, you know, takes pressure off of the GM to always have an answer for everything. If the players can just, you know, make things happen. Um, one of the other uh, loyal chum abilities calls improvise. And it's basically like MacGyvering together and an item in a pinch. So you can like, build a hang glider out of, you know, glue and a paper clip and like <laughs> a blanket or whatever. It's an envelope and a 30 feet of rope or whatever you got. And uh, the next class is the Knight Errant. It's the, uh, the fighter basically, but with um, like a leadership quality. Uh, this person is inspiring and uh, they ride a steed. You can choose, you start by picking out a steed and you've got three choices. You can choose a horse or a bogrel war tortoise or a, a zozo bird. And each one has their own, uh, their own powers. Um, you know, the knight errant definitely has the most combat abilities, probably double the combat abilities of the other classes. Um, but you can also do stuff like, you know, once per session, perform an act of heroic strength beyond the means of a normal adventurer or discerning eye once per session, create a weakness or vulnerability in someone or something within line of sight for narrative purposes. So that's like, Uh, just, uh, you know, noticing someone's weakness. Um, you can tell if someone's lying or uh, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. And for those of you that haven't read the Rickety Stitch graphic novel series, all of the classes are, are based off of character that exists in the series. So the Knight Errant, obviously, is based off of the Knight Errant character and... And you've got the, the gnome here, which is kind of an interesting 
um, class. It's not considered a species. It's considered a class. And it's actually both. That. It's it. Well, yeah, it's both. It's both. But um, but you can't. You, be, yeah. Yeah. Go you ahead. Can't be, you can't be a gnome bard or anything. You, you're just a gnome. You're both the yeah. species and the class. It's like the right. old school D and I'm just a a dwarf or an elf. You're just the elf, right? So yeah, the gnome, uh, based on El Norman Fuddle, and the well, gnome is all about the, yeah, the gnome is all about magic and uh, nature and that type of stuff. Lore, they know about the world. Um, they can make stuff up about you know plants and creatures. They can call on animals to help them. Um, they can cast spells. They're the only class that can cast magic. Like this is a pretty low magic system. Uh, only the gnome has magic, but there are a ton of magical items, and uh, we'll get to that. Next class is the rascal. Yeah, so like in the land of Eam, um, a lot of the world is, it's, you know, in the, in the first part of the book, it talks about how the world is run by the bad guys. It's, it's riddled with dungeons and ruled by fiends. Less like a, your classic rogue or classic thief character, but more like a rough and tumble trying to get by in this world that's kind of dastardly. And so there's lots of different ways that you can play the rascal, but we love it. It's like a little bit like a Robin Hood type character or, or like your Shakespearean Jack Falstaff, you know, near do well knight kind of thing. Or you could play, you know, like your roguish thief. Right, right. Of course. Um, Hi, Mario. How you doing? Got any questions? Let us know. Um, one cool thing the uh, rascal can do is spread a rumor throughout the land. Um, they can spread false rumors, and depending on what you roll, it's how far that rumor spreads. It can spread all across the, the realm or the region or your immediate area. Um, they also have secret hideouts they can go to. They can call on their uh, gang of rascals to help them in heists and other skullduggery. So they're a fun class. Uh, and lastly, we have the Dungeoneer. And the Dungeoneer is sort of a daring treasure hunter uh, who has tons of resources on hand. Uh, they can pull items out of their bags even if they don't have it in their inventory um, and they can pull out cutting edge pieces of technology um, they also have NPCs that follow them around like an underling you start with an underling who is basically your assistant and you can also level one ability as a boggle crew just like a bunch of boggles that just imagine Indiana Jones uh Raiders of the Lost Ark, like the beginning, he's, he's got a crew of dudes with him and they all kind of die off <laughs> <laughs> as the adventure progresses. All, you know, a little bit like Star Trek red shirts. They're just like, will they, will they make it? Or Yeah, so Boggle Crew is great for like testing traps. <laughs> Seeing if traps go off. Um, cool way to use the Boggle Crew, but uh, a lot of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> hey! Uh, go walk over there. I see a raised stone that might have a bear trap underneath it. <laughs> they can also, uh, you know, they have maps. They know how to get around. One of their abilities is called guide. And once per session, they can make it up an alternate route uh, built in with an obstacle in order to bypass a different location. So, like, say you're faced with a locked door and no one can get through. You're like, well, let's go. Let's go this way. There's an ink ink pot spider den over here, but it provides another way through. You know, you're not just stuck. And so, over and over again, there are a lot of creative powers in the land of Eam, 
And that's been the, the more than just having creative solutions to things. Ben and I really like the idea of propelling the story and propelling the adventure and making, you know, being Dungeons and Dragons classically is a really um, collaborative game. You know, you hang out with your friends, you play the game, you go on adventures, things don't go the way you expect. And with the Land of Eam, we wanted to take that kind of concept and gamify it even more so that you can create an NPC, you can create a solution to a problem, and then that's the situation that, you're, that your heroes are in. And so just time and time again, there's creative solutions that actually directly impact the narrative of what's going on in the room and what's going on on your adventure. Yeah. And Mario asks, is Land of Eam a D&D type game? Yeah, it's a role-playing game. Hey, Mario, um, yeah. It's, it's like D&D in that way, and it and you roll dice, and you make a party of adventurers. Um, we were saying earlier that it, it differs in, from d d in that um, it's less combat-focused. You have less tools to be like a crunchy combat fighter. Um, but there is combat. See, we got the combat section. Um, the cool thing about our combat is that um, it's pretty quick. Characters don't have a lot of uh, life HP. Um, so you're not sitting there for hours doing one combat. And it's built into the mechanic that you can attack one, attack somebody and they can counterattack you if you roll a six through eight. So you're pretty quickly chipping away at each other. Um, this, this rule book here is like already over a hundred pages, and part of that is because a lot of what we've done is make a bunch of random tables <laughs> <laughs> that take up pages and pages. Yeah, Ben and I particularly enjoy creating random tables and creating items and creatures and things and and uh, you know characters. We're going to do a little bit of that today, actually. James, your voice has an echo. My voice has an echo. Let me see if I can solve it. Is that any better? I think it might have to do with the mic, but I don't think we can handle it now. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry about that. Next time I'll have a different mic and there will be no echo on me. Um, anyway, like the, the different tables and stuff is a good segue into actually what we're going to do today. Cause we're going to do some actual design of stuff and not just talk about it. Um, we're going to make some NPCs cause we're also making, um, a, a sandbox setting that you can just play with the game. It'll be two separate books. You have the core rule book and... A sandbox setting with tons of quests and NPCs and locations. So, uh, if you want to run the game, you'll have the entire Mucklin's realm there for you. Mario, you read our first book. Thank you so much for reading. Yeah, thank you so much, Mario. How'd you like it? Um, so, let's get to that. We already we started an example of what we're doing. So we're just we are making NPC villains basically. Um, gonna make their name, species, class, slash job, or you know whatever they do, their motivation and their traits that they have. So uh, a GM can easily plug and play a bunch of characters in our world. So let's so, yeah. get started. Here's the first example. It's um, Rog and Tog, Sons of Krog. Uh, <laughs> anybody that's read Rickety Stitch Book 2 might be familiar with those characters. They, they appear in there. And they're goblins, and they're corporate goons. And their motivation as bad guys is that they're vying for control of their infamous father's goblinoid industrial empire. 
These two goons want to discredit Kraven's Men's Inc. from within and force their father out of the family business. So they want to take over their family business and they're backstabbing, a little bit humorous and very materialistic. So that's like a example of a, a foe that your heroes might come across that's got their own motivations and can add some flavor to campaigns and give GMs that tool that, that Ben talked about. Hey, thanks, okay. Mario. So let's make another one. Um, All right, make some characters. What should we start out with here? It's like a, it's like a bandit, a boggart bandit. All right, we got a bandit, a boggart. Boggarts are cousins of goblins without the pointy nose. Or sharp teeth. Mumford. <laughs> Mumford the clubber. He's a bit of a bruiser. Let's see what his motivation is. Um, let's say, let's say that he's in debt and he needs to steal as much money as he can because he owes, he owes. Um, some bad guys in a, in a gang. Let's say he's, uh, it's not too bright. Yeah. He's dim-witted. So Mumford the Clever is racked with debt. This dim-witted bandit owes more money to the Tricky Toe Gang than he can ever pay back. Watch out, he'll steal your stuff. Oops, I was muted. So, I mean, we can eventually uh, add to this later on, but I think that's as far as we're going to go with these today. Um, <laughs> Mario wanted to add that he owes two billion gold. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. How about two pouches of gold? That's a great idea. Two pouches of gold to the Tricky Toes. All right, so we've just we've got two in the works. We've got Twee Bumpernickel, Shroom Engineer, uh, Una the Shroud, Human Pirate. So, kind of want to make like a, a sort of a, a nefarious inventor. Mad scientist. If 
I changed engineer to mad scientist, would you be angry, Mr. Coffin? No. I would not be angry. Uh, Mario asks, are there dragonborn or a cyborg? Um, there aren't because it's all set in our own world, the world of Rickety Stitch. Um, so we've we've compiled our own set of species and stuff like that. Um, there are uh, salamander people. Maybe that's and the there are. And in a new project we're working on, there's actually um, some autonomous type robot guys, which are pretty much like cyborgs. Yeah, they're like ro robot droids. All right. Um, I, I'm realizing we're not talking that much right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we just uh, sort of got to work. Um, what's the name of the, the troll faction in in the Macron span? Do you remember? Well, they're in Dunk. Hey, Mario, that's awesome that you're drawing while you're watching this. We love to draw. We draw all the time. Ben's probably going to draw a little bit soon. Yeah, that might be more interesting. Maybe. Yeah. We can who, switch between them. I'm going to keep making some characters. Who should I draw out of these people? Yeah, Mario, who would you like to see Ben draw out of these characters here? Oh, he says the names are so small. Maybe you can increase the size on. Um, I can't. Um, well, I could do this, but. Can you uh, go to the, just go to the dock where it says 100% and put it to 200? There you go.
Um, Guess I'll go with Mog Yoro over here. Okay, let's do it. Troll Bounty Hunter. Mog was a troll that was banished by banished from working under bridges by the trolls of the Drippy Down. This bruiser earns a living hunting adventurers for the goblin industrial industrialists of the used to be for. Thanks, Toongrin. <laughs> we love making up names. It's the best. I love his nose, Ben. Trolls got horns in our world. Like ram horns or goat horns. And then you give Mog a man catcher. <laughs> Love it. Thanks for stopping by and usually cheesy. Uh, hopefully you can come by next time we do this. Yeah, thanks. So anybody wondering why um, Ben always does the sketches in blue out of habit because when we are drawing the comic, um, in the old days before everybody was drawing stuff on digital, you would draw all of your art in blue pencil so that you would be able to ink it. And when you scanned the art, the blue would not show up on the scanner. And so now it's like a tradition for Ben. He still uses the blue to 
the sketch, and then once he sketches it, he inks over it in black and then begins the coloring and shading. Yeah, it's just easier to, for me to see. I have a question from Toongrin. What inspired you to create Rickety Stitch? And what drives you to believe it is a story worth telling? Mm, that's a great question. So Rickety Stitch is the story of discovery for a character that uh, doesn't know who he is. And so when Ben and I first created Rickety Stitch, we wanted to tell the story of uh, a character that was that in themselves a storyteller. Uh, they weren't a, a traditional heroic type. They weren't Hercules, you know. Uh, instead, they were a bard and they told stories. But the only story they couldn't tell is the story of themselves. And so, just like anybody else, like you know, but growing up, Ben and I wanted to know who we were, like what we were supposed to do with ourselves. And we thought, let's tell the story of a storyteller who wants to figure out who he was and he was alive. And one of the reasons Ricky Stitch is a skeleton is because there's nothing more anonymous than that. We're all, you know, skeletons underneath our skin. And um, it'd be really tough to find out who we were, especially if we um, suddenly, you know, magically were raised from the dead and didn't understand our, our organs at all. So um, we also really wanted to tell a story that uh, had elements of high fantasy, elements of, of goofiness, um, used the kind of cartoony art style that Ben and I are both really passionate about and really like, but, uh, you know, also it's got a little bit of a, a, of a bone vibe and that it's, it's tone can shift from, from, you know, goofy world to very serious world. And that's really fun to write. Thanks. It was a great question. Also, um, you know, what makes it a story worth telling? It's an interesting question. Um, I kind of feel like any story you want to tell is worth telling. Um, people often get caught up with someone else is already doing this or this idea has already been done, but as long as you can like bring your own mm -hmm. yeah. spin on it told from you, it's going to be no one else can like do exactly what you do. Mario's saying like skeletons have no memories from when they awake reawaken. Yeah. Um, that's the unique thing about rickety stitch. He's, um, he's kind of one of a kind other skeletons. They obviously have no memories, but they also have no minds and rickety stitch has somehow retained his mind and soul and he doesn't know why.
and then have no nonsense troll chin. <laughs> Oh, how should these guys lit and this guy's legs look? You know, just have I don't know. pants or no pants. <laughs> I'm a fan of no pants, but yeah, like no, like, well, Chewba like Chewbacca. He's got no pants. He's like Chewbacca. He's we got... all know you're a fan of no pants. All right, <laughs> you don't want to see what's going on under there. Yeah. Live streaming in my sweats. <laughs> Why I'm literally in sweats right now. I I am actually in jeans. So you you are the you are the one, Benjamin. Tungren says a noble butt flap. <laughs> Ship it. I am a fan. A noble butt flap is is what it's about. Use all of your creative powers, Ben. Make this reality. Tune Green, I don't know if you followed <laughs> us back when we first launched the webcomic of Rickety Stitch. Um but Golo, the ogre. In book one, he used to just wear a loincloth with a front flap and a butt flap. Or maybe he didn't even have a butt flap. He didn't have a butt flap because um, originally Golo uh, put Ziggy in his butt instead of his nose. <laughs> and that, <laughs> that was like the one thing that was edited by the publisher. <laughs> yeah, but please the funniest professional meeting we've ever had in our lives. Mario says, I imagine Ricky Stitch has Papyrus's voice from Undertale. We love Undertale. Undertale is such a delight. Funny thing is though, we, we came up with Ricky Stitch long before Undertale and yeah. um, we get a lot of Undertale comments. It's great though. Undertale is hilarious and fun. This is the first time I'm drawing in a couple weeks because um, I finished book three and then I just, you know, it's crunching really hard on that and I didn't feel like drawing for the last two weeks. Um, I guess I did a couple sketches here and there, but it's not coming to me super quick. <laughs> These are the times you just got to fight through it. Hmm. Let's take a look at uh, what James is doing. Uh... Got bellhop Betty over here. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah, Bellhop Betty. She's the she's a thief. She's a bottle, which is the 
tiny little characters in Rickety Stitch that are beholden to the goblin. And um, she's oh, got a typo here. She's uh, one of the richest boggles around. Bellhop Betty made her fortune stealing luggage from the patrons of Crogland, the gaudy amusement park. Um, Betty hopes to use her loot to to uh, free the boggles everywhere and uh, from the oppression of their goblin overlords. She's got a noble cause, but she's uh, stealing a lot of stuff to, to make it happen. Classic. <laughs> it's like... <Is> uh... it? <clears throat> It's like Robin Hood, you know what I mean? Except stealing from amusement park patrons. Thanks, Toon Grin. Um, that's a wonderful compliment. We appreciate it. We, we can't wait to release book three. And so you can check that one out too. See, Ben, I'm working on a bog roll. You got any ideas? His name is Borg9 Butterbrand. And uh, that's all I got. <laughs> Borg9 Butterbrand. Um, he is a... Con artist, um, grifter. He's trying to get the fortune of the Munch family. <laughs> the second Munch reference we have in 10 characters. I didn't see the other one. That's fine. <laughs> Let's make it happen. Munch. <laughs> Bellhop Betty. It's a tale as old as time. Wonderful name. Thanks, guys. What was the other munch? Uh, Ivor of Munch, jealous of the Munch family. Cousin Ivor believes if he were in charge, they would return to prominence and not live misty, musty, dusty, forgettable lives in an old castle. He's vengeful, proud, and conniving. Hmm. Well, mine's pretty similar because I was just thinking of like a, well, maybe, uh, maybe a pretender, were... like someone trying to say they're like a long lost cousin or whatever. Yeah, you know? yeah, right. But it doesn't have he's to be Munch. He's a pretender. Um, do we have any other royal families in the land of Eam? Uh, I'm not aware of any. I guess we have your Felmogs. We haven't touched them yet. Felmog Black Knights are famous for... Uh, their appearance in Ricky Stitch Book 2, The Middle Root Run. Toongren says, I can't wait until you release Book 3, Going Stir Crazy in Isolation. I've been reading Robert Kurtzman's Invincible, and it's uh, Robert Kirkman's Invincible, and it's Drew for my liking. liking. I need more of that sweet skeleton and slime. <laughs> well, <That's> cool. <laughs> thank you so much yeah, for the kind you. words. And I just finished, finished the art like two weeks ago. Right. Um, and all of this craziness with the coronavirus has happened. So we have a feeling that's going to push the release date back. Yeah, we haven't got a firm time for when it'll be released yeah. yet. But uh, if you're if you're Jones and for some rickety stitch, we, we actually created a um, an activity book that we released today. Uh, if you check out our website, ricketystitch.com slash blog, I believe. Let me check if that's accurate. Anyway, our latest blog post has a free download so that um, you can 
that you can actually uh, cr create your own Ricky Stitch adventure to it to a degree. Um, it's called the Goo's Great Escape, and um, the premise is some magical potion fell on Goo, and now he can talk in English, and uh, you get to fill in the blank to tell the story uh, that Goo has to tell. And um, English. In English, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in understandable language as opposed to gloops and, and bloops. Um, what was I going to say? Hey, Wayfarer, thanks. Wayfarer from Belarus, he says, um, I don't know English very best, but my Ricky, Ricky Stitch is my favorite comic. Thank you so much. That's what Thank I, what you. I want That's awesome. to, to hear. Thanks for were joining you, the stream. Were you able to get a uh, translated version? I, it's out in Russian. I don't know if you speak or read Russian or uh, Hebrew. Toon Grin says, "Curious why you don't have a, why not a Warforge type character? Those are cool robot folks with D and D." Um, yes, so actually we do kind of have that card. We're working on a couple of new projects now that take place in the land of Eam. And um, there are characters called sputter servants or sputter birds or sputter creatures, which um, make their it's first like, appearance yeah. in book two. Yeah, like the and, sputter horses that yeah, drive the, the wagon. That, that drive their caravan. And so there are characters that we're introducing that are going to be... Um, <laughs> Gooey with the voice of Tim <laughs> <laughs> That's spot on. <laughs> please, please make that happen and share it and send it to us. We would love, we would love that. That's hilarious. Wow, great progress on uh, on the troll bounty hunter, Ben. It's looking fantastic. Mog Yoro is short-tempered and greedy. Saved it for the first time. Always save your things more often than I do. <laughs> oh, man. That would have been a lot. He's a beaut. He's a beauty. So, we're working on the RPG, but... Um, we have plans to make these uh, NPCs into card decks as well to accompany the RPG. So you can just quickly pull out a fiend like this guy um, and have him at the ready. Yeah, we, and, we want to make lots of these. And we want, we want the sandbox stuff to be fully compatible with other games as well, like D&D. &D, so... It's more about the characters in the world. Um, we will have our own complete game system, which is super fun, we believe. But we also want to make tools just to make playing in our world in other systems easier. So just a heads up, guys, we're... Uh... Closing in on the end of our first stream, but you can guarantee, we're guaranteed we're going to do more of them. Um, we have four minutes left, so any last questions? Um, Toon Grin, any chance for a gooey plush merch? 
he seems easily toyetic for an executive to approve that idea. That's <laughs> fantastic. Um, it's a great word, love, toyetic. Toyetic is a great word. Um, we would love to make a GUI plush. I don't, we don't have any plans for it just yet, but that's a great idea. Yeah, that is, I mean, we've certainly thought of that. Um, that would be awesome mm -hmm. to make happen. I think we would have to kickstart it or something. Um, the first Kickstarter we're probably going to do is the RPG. And then who knows if that goes well, maybe that'll open up the door for other Kickstarters. Yeah. All right, I think that's the sketch, the, you know, pencil drawing of Magioro complete. The bounty hunter troll. Zoom in on him a little bit, Benjamin. It's got a big old man catcher. Yeah. So this is a, this is a great example of, um, Sorry, technical difficulties behind me. <laughs> this is a great example of um, an, a foe or NPC that um, we're going to create for our, our fiends and foes uh, deck. Yeah, so we're going to have art for each NPC as well as this type of information here. Tungren says, I've recently discovered Adam Copel's Dungeon World. That's great, by the way. Dungeon World's fantastic. If you need a trailer to promote the RPG, reach out. My partner and I would edit it pro bono. Wow. Well, thank you very much for offering that. Wow. That's nice of you. Yeah, we may have to do just that. Um, stay, stay tuned to our next uh, podcast. And we'll, uh, well, podcast is live stream. <laughs> You know what I mean? I mean, it's all science and technology using computers. I mean, what are you going to do? Podcast. Um, Podcast. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Um, yeah, how, sure. how are you liking Dungeon World? I feel like that's the flavor we're going with, going after with our game, like the kind of storytelling vibe that you get with Dungeon World. It's, it's really, the dice system is really inspired by that one. Independent content needs more light cast on it. That is very uh -huh. true. For sure. For sure.
We've got Nadine Nanderfolk, Cordal Gator Boss. In a perfect world, Nadine would be queen, using her beautiful gators to munch their way to the top. But in the land of Eam, Nadine is a thumbbreaker for Nork's noodle gang. Don't want to be on her bad side or her gators. <laughs> so, a little backstory. <laughs> Nork's, Nork's noodle gang is a gang that has uh, formed around the leadership or the ownership of Nork's Noodle Hut, which is a chain of noodle restaurants. Um, <laughs> uh, I got the DW book, but I've never played and I'm intimidated to DM it myself. I had a bad D&D experience that turned me off of tabletop and I'm concerned I do a poor job as DM and ruin it for the others. Yeah, oh. I mean, it, it can be scary. I think once you make the plunge, uh, you'll you'll get the hang of it. Especially if you're like with a group of friends, I think they'll be understanding. It is. I still find it a little intimidating to jump into a game with strangers. Yeah. Um, but I mean, as as long as everybody can remember that it's about having fun and and uh, doing this kind of collaborative play together, uh, it's a lot. It's a lot easier to. To do it. Yeah. Well, um, we've actually completed our live stream, Benjamin. We've got to, we've got to go. Yeah. Um, we're going to try to make this a regular thing. Um, it's not always going to be NPCs, but we're going to do some other aspect of designing the RPG. Um, yeah, we'll design, we'll draw, we'll write. Um, of course, we'll chat with you folks and answer questions and give you updates on what's coming out, and what's going on. And uh, as we finish the rule set, we'll we'll be able to um, share uh, the beta rules so that you guys can try out the rules yourselves or run games or check it out. And But I mean, more than anything, we wanna thank everybody for joining us. Um, and yeah. Norks Noodle Gang will need a shirt designed to promote the gang. Time. <laughs> <laughs> tea Public, yeah, we'll we'll definitely hit up the Tea Public. That's, that's great. Based on what we have, like, there's probably like twenty shirt designs based on the RPG that we could do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Right. Thank you for your time. This was a delightful experience. Well, thank you guys for joining again. Yeah, thank um, you, Mario and Toon Grin, for sticking around the whole time and. Uh, and let's, uh, what do you say, Ben? Let's try to make this happen next weekend. 11 o'clock, same time. Want to make it, want to make it uh, uh, a tradition? Yes. Yes. All right. Okay, folks. Thanks a lot. Take it All easy. All right. Thank you. Stay healthy. I know everybody's uh, quarantined at home or almost. Time and um, let's try to make the best of it. So, bye, guys. All right. Bye-bye.